button. All right, we have been looking at Matthew 24 for a long time. Uh, made this announcement uh, the, the last time I uh, spoke, and I'm going to make it again tonight. We are most likely going to move into some, uh, I don't want to say more basic, but foundational teaching after Matthew 24. Uh, and and uh, that's just where the Lord has my heart. And uh, there's a number of ministers on here, and I uh, want to share some things with the ministry, get the ministry to comment on them. Uh, and I consider you all ministry. Quite honestly, we all should do the work of ministry as we grow up in Christ. It shouldn't be just a what we call a preacher or teacher, but it's uh, upon us all to be ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so as we look at this in Matthew 24, one at least one more time, maybe two more of this particular subject, but at least one more, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And this, uh, I'll repeat this again too, this to me is the uh, if you want to say the big, I, I'm trying to find the right word. This is the word of words in Matthew 24, right here. Out of everything he says, this is the word of words. You know, a lot of people think the end of the temple is the word of words. But the word of words here is heaven and earth shall pass away. And he's talking about heaven and earth in, in the very beginning when he says, when they're talking about the temple, and we've looked at all that, established the the old heaven and old earth as uh, the old uh, Jerusalem and the uh, the old temple worship, the administration of God that was in that temple. We established that heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool, and God was enthroned between the cherubim. And the cherubim were in the temple. The Bible tells us that in multiple places that he was enthroned between the cherubim. And if you search your Bible out, you'll find out the cherubim were actually in the temple. And before that, in the tabernacle. And they were seated looking at the seat of mercy. So the cherubims were facing the mercy seat. And when the glory of the Lord appeared, my belief is what those cherubim represented is the church beholding the glory of the Lord. When the glory of the Lord appears, according to Paul, we are changed, transformed into the same image, the express image of Christ by the Spirit of the Lord. To me, I believe that's what those cherubim represent is the believer looking at the Lord, seeing the Lord. And, and I believe that. I, I love what it says in the King James. It says they were of one beaten work of gold. One work. And, and to me, that just speaks volumes. They were of the work of Christ. We are his workmanship. We're of one work. And that's the work we're of. And to me, that's what they represented. And God was enthroned there. His dominion was there. His dominion was according to the law. So everything up to that place was according to the law. Once the law was given, God's dominion was there. Okay? That was it. Till that passed, that was in force. You know, there's believers today that don't want to believe it was in force. They don't want to believe Moses heard God right. They don't want to believe a lot of stuff. And and I, and, I, and I guess what I would ask them is, what do you really believe, brother? If you don't believe Moses heard God, what do you believe? And I think, I think what it gets down to is self, is, is there's a lot of self. I know, I've seen myself. I've seen how ugly myself is. I've seen the difference between me and Jesus. Now, the beauty of the Lord is he's brought me into him. That's the beauty of the Lord is that through his grace, I'm in him. But outside of his grace, I've seen what I am. And it ain't pretty. 
And I, and I think any man that's honest when they see themselves would say the same thing. In fact, when John saw the Lord, he fell at his feet as dead. And so, and you know, Isaiah says, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. When he saw the Lord high and lifted up. So there's this con constant thing of seeing the Lord that brings a lowering I, I, i'm probably not using the right word but it brings self to its end it's what it does and you begin to see one greater than you so so jesus said heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall not pass away and i want to review a couple of things from last week because i think we should and then we'll build up on them in Isaiah chapter uh, 42. Isaiah 42. Verse 1. Says, Behold my servant whom I uphold my chosen and whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry nor lift up his voice nor cause it to be heard in the street. A bruised reed will he not break, and a dimly burning wick will he not quench. He will bring forth justice and truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he have set justice in the earth. And the isles shall wait for his law. Thus saith God, Jehovah, he that created the heavens and stretched them forth, he that spread abroad the earth and that which comes out of it, he that gives breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein, I, Jehovah, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thy hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeons and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. And the emphasis I have here is I will give thee. I will give thee for a covenant. So the covenant's a person. The new covenant is the person of Jesus Christ. That's what it is. And now, in this, while we're looking at this thought, you know, my spirit shall be upon him, and just gathering some things back up in our minds. John, when Jesus went down to the Jordan and was baptized of John, the Spirit of God came upon him as a dove. My Spirit shall be upon him. Okay? So we know this is speaking of him. And God says where we're going to go, Isaiah uh, 59, and, his wor and my word's going to be in his mouth. So here in Isaiah 59, in Isaiah 59, and this, this to get a hold of is just to me powerful. In Isaiah 59, 20 and 21, and a redeemer will come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgressions in Jacob saith Jehovah. And as for me, this is my covenant with them. With the people that turn from transgressions, here's his covenant saith Jehovah. My spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, save Jehovah, from henceforth and forever. So here a Redeemer comes, and in his mouth, according to the word of God, is the covenant of the Lord. Here's my covenant, my spirit, and my words. Now, Jesus, I think, brought this to its uh, conclusion when he says, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. So, so Jesus declared his words to be spirit. The words he speaks. So the new covenant, if I look at these three thoughts in, in these two places, Isaiah 42 and 59, the new covenant is one, a person. 
The new covenant is his spirit. The new covenant is his words. Now, how's all that defined in a person? Because all of that is defined in the person of Christ. The spirit of God is known in the person of Christ. The word of God is known in the person of Christ. It finds its place in a person. That's what it does. What does the Spirit of God do to us? Well, we say makes us jump and shout and sing and holler, and I ain't against that. Sometimes I think we need to jump and shout a little bit. <laughs> but what it does is it leads us into all truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. What it does is it baptizes us into his body. By one spirit, we are baptized into one body. We're baptized according to the book of Ephesians, I believe, into the body of his death. That we've been reconciled in the body of his death. But we come forth by the spirit into the body of his life. So, so the spirit deals with the person, the person of Christ. And I, and I believe we that have come through the Pentecostal experience, if we could get a hold of this, it would really help us. The spirit is always dealing with Christ. Of his fullness, we have received. So if I've received the fullness of Christ, or we have as a body, I don't, I don't think we individually have it's according to how you look at it. If I look at the word fullness as completion, then we individually have received the completion of Christ. If I look at, at fullness as all of him, then I look at that corporately. Because I don't believe any one of us is walking in all of him individually. I believe that's a corporate measurement of the Lord. But we all have received his completion and many times in the king james version the word completion is translated as fullness and that's what we've received is his completion we can re we have received his complete work his death burial and resurrection his ascension seated at the right hand of god made one going back into the father back into that that he was we have received that and we're living in that. That's what we're living in. Glory to the Lamb of God. So when Isaiah declares that his spirit and his words are the covenant and that his seed, that this, this covenant is made with the Redeemer and the Redeemer's seed and his seed's seed. And I said this, this is the disciples, his seed. Isaiah 53 that we've talked about, his seed. He shall see his seed. And so initially, that's the disciples. That are those that have lived with Jesus, dwelled with Jesus. And when he raised from the dead, he brought them with him. You know, when he come back in the form of the Holy Ghost, they were raised up. But then it says his seed, seed. <laughs> that's... Uh, that includes us. That includes all believers. Because, see, this word of covenant is a continual covenant. See, that's what God said in Isaiah. This would be his covenant from henceforth and forever. Now this gets simple. Heaven and earth shall pass, but my word shall not pass away. So what has been established since Jesus walked up on the earth in the simplicity of this, he that believeth on me shall not perish but have everlasting life. Okay. In the simplicity of this statement, that was established. His word. Put in a force. When he rose from the dead, that's in force. 
And what does Peter preach on the day of Pentecost? Believe on Jesus and be saved. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's what he says. He preached to them Jesus. He re preached repentance in his name. He preached believing into Christ. That's what the apostles begin to teach and preach throughout the book of Acts. As they began to preach and teach Jesus repentance in his name, believing on him. I, I, I'm wanting to get carried away, but I want to establish a few things. In John 17, John 17, reading a few verses here, in uh, verse 8, Jesus says, for I have given them the words that you gave me. See, here's, here's what Isaiah 59 said. The words which I have put in thy mouth, and then the mouth of thy seed, and the mouth of thy seed's seed. So here Jesus says, for I have given them the words that you gave me. See, Jesus said he was speaking the words of the Father. So now he's given the words that God gave him to the disciples. And they received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you and they believe that you sent me. Now, verse 14. He says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. See here he says. I have given them your word. So here he's given them the word of God. The words he's speaking, he's given to his disciples. Okay? Now coming on down to verse 20 here, Jesus says, I do not ask for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So now through their word, which is his word, which is God's word, get a hold of this, that they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them that they may be one as we are one. I in them, thou in me, that they may become perfect in one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and love them even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. So here's what Jesus prays, that they may be one, that those that believe on him through their word would be one. Now, their word is his word. <laughs> his word is the word that God said would be declared through the prophets. So God declared this word through the prophets. Jesus come and brought forth what was hidden in the prophets into the earth. Set it forth, the word of faith. Paul called it the word of faith, which we now preach. And we dealt with this a few weeks ago, and I want to revisit it for a moment. In Romans 10, in Romans 10, and then in Deuteronomy 30, Paul says, verse 6, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh this wise, Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess 
with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. See, here's the word of faith. He that believeth on me, thou shalt be saved, and, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. This is the word of faith. This is what the scripture said. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is what Jesus brought forth when he come forth and he began to declare himself. He brought this forth and set it forth in the earth. And by believing on him, he said that they may be one as we are one. So, so you know, many Christians got part of this right to, that you have to believe on Jesus. But then they don't understand the significance of believing on Jesus. That now that I've believed into him, I am to become one with him. I and them, thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one. See, this is the operation of the Holy Ghost making us aware of what God has done in Christ. What we have in our salvation. And see, See, what's so powerful here in Romans 10, if you go back and understand what the law said, according to this, Romans, Romans becomes more, even more powerful than what we've understood. Because if I look at Deuteronomy, this same thing or similar is found in the book of Deuteronomy, verse 11, 30 verse 11. For this is the commandment which I command thee this day. It is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It's not in heaven that thou shouldst say us who shall go up to heaven and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldst say who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. See, I have set before thee this day life and good, death and evil. See, he's dealing here with the old covenant. See, I told you the law spoke of Christ. I told you the last two weeks that the law itself spoke of the life of another. That's why it frustrated man so much, because man would look at the law and like Paul said, would agree with it, that it's holy and just, it's good. But I don't have the power in myself to do it. <laughs> and the reason I didn't have the power in myself to do it is it was always speaking of another man. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It was a lamp shining unto a perfect day. And that, that perfect day is the Lord. So it was a lamp unto my feet, guiding me to Jesus. That's what it was doing. Now the word is nigh in my heart and in my mouth, the word of faith that I confess him that has fulfilled the law. <laughs> that could actually do it. He come forth and he did it so I confess him. And the benefit that I get is I get moved by the spirit into him. Now that's my benefit. He did it. See, we couldn't do it. That's why righteousness wasn't of the, of the law. It was of a person. Because by the law, every man became guilty. Why did they become guilty? Because they couldn't find the ability in themselves to do it. And I'm going to repeat this one more time. It was speaking of the life of another. So he that it was speaking of came and gave his life for us. And that's the word exchange. It's in your Bible, reconciliation. He exchanged his life, became us and died, and brought us to himself. 
took us away in the reconciliation, took away the old man, and brought us into himself. That they may be one as we are one. And how all that's achieved is this word, he says, I in them. Thou in me, that they be made perfect in one. Now we get a whole something. Now you are the body of Christ. Man, if you could just get the church to agree on that, what power would be manifested? Now you are the body of Christ. You're not the body of Pentecostal holiness or Baptist or Catholic. You are the body of Jesus Christ. That's what you are. That's who you are. I've shown you your identity tonight. You're the body of Jesus Christ. That's who you are. Now, you may need to know what operation or function you have in his body but you're his body that's who you are that's all the identity you really need now now if we move further on in ephesians chapter 4 in particular ephesians 4 we're going to read a few scripture here in ephesians 4 start at verse 1 I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation where you're called. You're the body of Christ. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Catch this little word here. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. It means to make effort to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, in the joint tie ligament, this word bond means. Uniting, it's like a ligament. Uniting in peace. He made peace with his cross. He made us one. See, we read over these little things. There is one body. See, here's the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who's above all, through all, and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, here it is again, of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. Till we become united in him. Till we become one. See, that's what Paul's saying. Till we come, become one. He gave ministry to make us see we are one. We are one body in the Lord, that they may be one. See, Paul's not preaching something addition or different what Jesus said. He's declaring, he's, he's exhorting us with what Jesus said, that they may be one. Here he's, he's telling you till they come to the unity of our faith, to the united in the faith, as one body, that's how we're united, as one body with one head. There's only one head. There's only one body. There's not many bodies here. There's one body and one head, and we're his. 
to grow up. Paul goes on here to say, as we're united, when we come to the unity of our faith, to come to where we're united in Christ as one body, then we come to the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no, ch no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning crafting, craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in the love, in love, may grow up into him, the head, him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, from Christ is what it's saying, the whole body is fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, this is his divine intention, that you may be one. So our unity in Christ is we're one body. We've all been made to drink of the same spirit. And the purpose of the spirit is to mature us in him. That he would have preeminent. See, why is this? Well, Paul says it this way, that we wouldn't be tossed to and fro. What, what, what's going on in the church today? It's tossed to and fro. What's tossing it? Doctrine. Teaching. See, see, what's it moved from? The simplicity of Christ. Paul told them in, in one place that they're, they're, what, they were removed from Christ in the book of Galatians. See, see this, whenever somebody's presenting something other than him, it's going to move you. And you have this fragmented in the earth today instead of this glorious body of Christ. What you see, it is the glorious body of Christ. It just doesn't know it if it's his. But what you see is this fragmentation fragmented group of people. They don't know they're one. You know, you hear silly things said, well, the Baptists and Pentecostals will have to get along in heaven. There won't be no Baptists or Pentecostals in heaven. You hear silly comments like that, and, and you think it ends there. Then you come into people that, that, that teach a deeper life message, and they're, and they're now talking about what tribe are you of? And, and I, want, I want to say, well, there's only one body. I, I actually said this to one brother. There's only one body. We're not of different tribes. We're of his body. Now, we may understand a different measure of him. We may be in a place of a different relationship with him. But our relationship is all centered upon Jesus Christ, the head. And that's why this whole thing has to, his word has to remain. See, when I quit preaching his word, when I quit declaring his word, then what do I have? I'll have my word. It won't do anything. It's his word that he made us one to be his manifestation in the earth. Now, there was one other thing I wanted to really get out is we read it, we read it, the word of faith that is nigh thee in the heart and the mouth, the word of faith. Thou believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. See, that his word and his spirit, 
Now, now that's his word, and what we're declaring tonight's his word. But Jesus goes on to say, out of your bellies will flow his spirit. See, Isaiah 59 again, his word and his spirit. His word and his spirit. So what flows out of us when we share Christ is his word and his spirit. That's what flows out of us. Out of your belly, out of your innermost being flows rivers of living water. I, I said this Sunday morning, I said this other night, when we go into a place and we come in in his authority, in his word, and we establish him, establish his word in that place, see, then it's going to work. Because we're coming in his name, we're coming in his authority. We're his body. We should be in his name and authority. It's just establishing. Because that's who we are. We're his body. He lives in us. We live in him. Here in the earth. Here in the earth right now. Of his fullness we have received grace upon grace. And God is revealing in our hearts what we've received of Christ. God is showing us what he's made unto us. See, Jesus was already God. He already was the nature and character of God before he became a man. Christ was already God, the nature of God. We weren't. We were the nature of Adam. That's what it means to be an Adam, born of Adam. We were his nature. We were his mind. We didn't know the mind of God. So Jesus came to bring us to himself. Now we are the body of Christ. Now we are the body of Christ. We're going to say this till we believe it. This is who we are. He is glorious body to manifest him in the earth so his words established and and last thing i'm going to say about this endeavoring to keep the unity of the faith you remember jesus saying abide in me let my words abide in you we we talked about this a whole lot if he, if my words abide in you you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. See, this, this is it. Does this abide? Does it remain? Are we endeavoring with one another to be in the unity of the faith? Yes. To be his body. To make all men see. To make the church know. It's one. That's, that's when you begin to understand why Paul would go and lay down his life to believers because he wanted them to know they were one in Christ. Amen. Well, just keep that thought, endeavoring to keep the unity the oneness of the body. Endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit, the oneness of the body. That's the unity of the spirit is we're united in one Christ, one body, one new man. That's the unity of the spirit. And in that one new man, there is peace, rest, and joy. Hallelujah, what a relationship we're in with the Father, through his Son, Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen.
glory to the Lamb of the living God. I'm going to stop right there. God bless you. Have a great night. I'm going to turn it over to Brother Mark. I'm done tonight.